Good evening. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone on behalf of the LBJ Future Forum Board of Directors and uh, thank everyone for coming out tonight and weathering both the weather and the parking situation to be with us for uh, an event I've been looking forward to uh, for a while, our uh, discussion on uh, voting rights. Um, before we get started, I want to mention uh, just a couple of quick upcoming events on the Future Forum calendar. Um, one is Illuminations Holiday Reception at the uh, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center on Saturday, December 13th. Uh, it's going to be a private reception for Future Forum members from 5 to 6, which is going to include wine and hot chocolate bar, and then we'll explore the festivities uh, afterwards. It is family friendly, so bring the families <laughs> with you. Um, the next is an event uh, that we're going to have that's uh, coming soon, probably the first couple weeks in December, on a discussion of the, uh, the Ebola uh, crisis and whether or not it's a crisis or not, which should be very, very interesting. Um, but as I mentioned, and the reason we're here is for our discussion on the Voting Rights Act, um, we're really pleased to host a discussion of this important piece of legislation. Uh, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, signed into law on August 6th, 1965. And voting rights are still a topic of hot debate, which you hear in the news media all the time. In June of 2013, the Supreme Court struck down the preclearance section of the Voting Rights Act as unconstitutional. Since then, voting rights have continued to be a topic of debate in and out of the courts across the country. Tonight, we've convened a group of experts to discuss uh, some of the recent legal rulings, the Texas voter ID law, and how and if they may have affected this most recent election. At the end of the program, our guests will be available to answer questions, and then in uh, future form uh, tradition, we'll uh, discuss it over drinks for a while <laughs> as well. Um, what I'm gonna do is uh, briefly uh, introduce our speakers and then let them get rolling. Um, first, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce and welcome uh, Do uh, uh, Joe uh, uh, Desotel. Got the right guess. Uh, <laughs> who is a communications night. director for the Travis County Democratic Party. He's worked three legislative sessions in three, and in three winning citywide campaigns in Austin, including being the political director for Mary Lee Leffingwell. Joe also writes for the Burnt Orange Report. Joe, thank you for being here. Thanks. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Professor Joseph Fishkin from my alma mater, University of Texas Law School. Uh, he's our neighbor uh, right next door. Always like to have UT law professors here personally. His research and teaching interests include election law and equal opportunity. And in February, he released a book on equal opportunity titled Bottlenecks. He received his BA and JD from Yale and served as a Fulbright scholar at Oxford. So he's a pretty smart guy. Thanks for being here. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Hans von Spakowski who joins us from the Heritage Foundation in DC, where he's senior legal fellow and manager of the election law reform initiative. He studies campaign finance restrictions, voter fraud and voter ID, enforcement of federal voting rights laws and administration of election. Previously, he served on the Federal Election Commission and in the Justice Department, providing expertise in enforcing the Voting Rights Act and the Help America Vote Act of 2002. Um, and finally, I'd like to introduce our esteemed moderator, uh, Representative Sherry Greenberg. Uh, Sherry's now the director of the Center for Politics and Governments at uh, the LBJ School of Public Affairs and a lecturer and fellow of the Max Sherman Chair in state and local government. Uh, many of you will recall that she served for 10 years as a member of the Texas House representing uh, Austin. So. Sherry, thank you. I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here this evening. This is certainly an important uh, issue and one that is not new. It's not new in the United States, in Texas, uh, not new to any of us, but it continues to evolve. I'd first like to ask each of our panelists to just very briefly tell us, how did you land in this seat? Why are you up here tonight? Well, I think I'm... My name is Joe Desotel. Again, I work right. for the Travis County Democratic Party right now. I'm also a blogger, and I cover a lot of different election issues. Um, I think I'll bring a more practical aspect of the sort of the actual application of this law. I have worked in grassroots, worked directly with the um, 
county tax assessor who does voter registration and actually uh, work to get out the vote and, and see uh, at the actual voting booth level how this law has affected people. Um, I started back in 2002 in politics. I was got an internship with my local congressman, Congressman Nick Lampson in Southeast Texas. I'm from Beaumont. Uh, eventually became a staffer, then 2003 happened with redistricting. I'm sure everybody's aware of that debacle. I think that is very much a part of voting rights. I think what happened there very much affects uh, people's ability to vote and their motivation for voting, which I'll talk about later, as I think is extremely important. Um, then I actually uh, worked as an administrator uh, through 2006 and 2008 for the primaries when I saw Obama and the incredible turnout uh, and motivation that he did to voters. Um, and then through there, I started uh, my first legislative session in 2011 uh, after moving to Austin in 2010. I worked for uh, Mayor Lee Leffingwell's political director, as was mentioned. Right. Uh, so my experience is very much just with trying to get people to the polls and talking to a lot of voters and figuring so out what it is. Yeah, a lot of grassroots motivation okay. stuff. So Thank you. Yeah. So one of the subjects I teach at UT Law is election law. And it's a subject that uh, didn't exist probably about... 15 years ago, I happened to show up in law school right after a case you might have heard of, Bush v. Gore. <laughs> and as we were all trying to make sense mm -hmm. of what this case meant, the interaction between politics and law in the court and voting rights, um, suddenly law schools all around the country, it kind of occurred to them, huh, we should really have someone teaching election law. Mm -hmm. And the long-term result of that is that I am here, uh, <laughs> which I think is a terrific outcome. And um, so from the beginning uh, of my uh, time as an academic, I've been very interested in voting rights and campaign finance and other election law questions. The first article that I wrote was about uh, voter ID laws, so happy to be here. Uh, I'm Hans von Spakovsky, and I know you're thinking with that name, he's not from around here. <laughs> That's right, I was born and raised in Alabama. Um, uh, Joe's absolutely right, you know, really before the 2000 election, hardly any law schools taught election law. Now, I've been working in this area for about 25 years. Um, I spent four years at the Justice Department in the Civil Rights Division. Uh, I was the voting counsel to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, so my job was uh, coordinating enforcement of not just the Voting Rights Act, but uh, the other federal laws that protect everyone's right to vote, including uh, the, the newest law that was passed in 2002 after the 2000 election, which was the Help America uh, Vote Act. Um, I then spent two years at the Federal Election Commission. Federal Election Commission is a federal agency that's responsible for enforcing the federal laws that govern uh, fundraising and spending of money in federal campaigns. So anyone running for Congress or, or the president the FEC is responsible for enforcing uh, the, the fundraising rules on them. Um, unlike a lot of the lawyers at the Justice Department, I, when I worked there, I was one of the few that actually had, um, in addition to experience in the law, mm -hmm. uh, experience in the actual um, administration of elections down at the grassroots level. And that's because when I was a private attorney in um, Atlanta, Georgia, I spent five years on the Fulton County uh, Registration and Election Board. That was the board that was responsible for voter registration and running the polls on election day in the largest county in Georgia. Um, I also spent three years uh, just recently on the Fairfax County Electoral Board. Uh, Fairfax County is the largest county in Virginia, and again, that's the board that's responsible for voter registration and election. So I've basically been involved in the, in the election and voting area okay. from the, 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 the bottom most level where uh, people really do the work of getting people registered and running the polls on election day, you know, all the way up to the federal level at the Justice Department and at the FEC where they uh, enforce the laws on this. I've also written quite a bit about this. I've testified in front of Congress. Uh, numerous times. Uh, two years ago, uh, John Fund and I wrote a book about uh, election integrity in the United States, and um, you know I continue to write uh, an awful lot about this and do a lot of research uh, into this issue. So as evidenced by your opening comments, this is a very broad topic. Uh, grassroots, campaign finance, and in fact, uh, when I first ran for the legislature, campaign finance was one of my issues, and then I was on the 
uh, Elections Committee. And we dealt with a number of issues. This was, of course, before the big uh, case that you mentioned, Professor. But early voting was certainly a topic. There's been some discussion to pull back to limit early voting. Uh, we've seen this in other parts of the country. Texas actually has what I would call a pretty robust early voting uh, program. What are your opinions on early voting? Um, should it remain the same? Should we pull back? Should we expand it? Should we have mail-in? What do you think? Well, I'll, I'll start if we want to go down the line. Um, I'll tell you, I, about 30-something uh, states now have early voting. All of you, I'm sure, realize that's a relatively new phenomenon. You know, 15 years ago, nobody had early voting. Everybody either went to vote on election day, or if you couldn't make the polls, you voted by absentee ballot, but there was no early voting. Now, a little more than half the states have it. Um, there's a couple of problems with early voting that I don't think people think about. The first is that we always complain about the fact that you know, campaigns get more and more expensive every year. People have to spend a lot of money to run for office, whether it's at the state or federal level. Uh, one of the problems with early voting is it makes campaigns more expensive. And the reason for that is that campaigns spend about 80, 90 percent of the money they raise normally in the, the couple of days right before election day. They spend huge amounts on their get out the vote efforts, on their efforts to persuade voters to vote for them. If you extend the voting period uh, to several weeks to, in some states now, a month and a half, um, you've got to raise a lot more money because if you don't do that same kind of uh, get out the vote effort over the entire early voting period, as a candidate, you're going to lose your election. The other problem with it is that if you're voting over a month and a half, it means that voters are not voting with the same base of information. We've all heard of October surprises, right? When information comes out about a candidate right before election day. Well, if you voted a month and a half before the election, you can't change your vote, it's already too late. And, and the final thing on this is, and I know this is counterintuitive, but there's actually a number of studies done, uh, several by American University, another one just recently by some professors at the University of Wisconsin, that conclude that uh, contrary to what you think, early voting does not increase turnout. In fact, what they did in the American University studies is they compared states with early voting to states that don't have. And you know what, they actually concluded that early voting may hurt turnout by just a small percentage. And the reason is they concluded was because, again, um, if you have to spread the get out the vote effort from a couple of days over a much longer period of time, it diffuses that get out the vote effort so it's not as effective. And they believe it actually may hurt um, uh, turn out by just a couple of percentage points. So the idea that early voting is this big, great solution is going to get people to the polls, I think that has been shown to be just, just not the case. Well, so I'm actually I'm somewhat amazed by that 80 to 90 percent number. Uh, if, if campaigns spend all that in the last couple of days, uh, I'm not sure what's left for all the advertising that takes up the majority of many campaigns' budgets. But anyway, that's a, somewhat of a, of a side issue. I think the thing about early voting uh, is it's certainly not a perfect solution to, to any, um, any of the problems that, that plague our election system, but it can be a kind of escape valve. I guess I would give one cheer to early voting, which would be if you talk to people who are even some very conservative people who actually have the responsibility of running local elections uh, on election day, Many of them would be very unhappy if Texas were to entirely eliminate early voting because overall it would mean a lot more of the people of the people who would have voted early will instead be there on election day. And on election day, things are pretty jammed as it is, and often we have some pretty serious delays and problems. So the hope with early voting and the hope with no excuse absentee voting, which a lot of states have, and frankly, the hope with uh, quite a few of the election reforms that are of this ilk is to try to create some escape valves, try to take some of the steam out of the pressure of getting everyone through this one little bottleneck of 
you've got to vote on election day. Here are the hours. Here's the place you've got to go. Um, one thing that I was impressed with Travis County doing recently is allowing people to vote at any location. That loosens the bottleneck a little bit, and it makes it possible for more people, but still not everybody who'd like to vote, um, to cast a ballot. So that's it's sort of one cheer for early voting, uh, maybe as an escape valve. I mean, I, <clears throat> I find some issues with um, what, what you were saying uh, about um, early voting costing more for elections, specifically because I think it's more dark money and super PACs that are actually making elections cost more and not uh, early voting periods. If people uh, have the opportunity to vote, uh, you mentioned it may drop in cert a certain percentage. I, I think that is not the case across the board necessarily, maybe in certain states and in certain examples within the margin of error that might have happened. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you're going to change the demographic and the makeup of the people who are, have the opportunity to go vote. So if you're talking about one day of voting on a Tuesday, you're, you're obviously going to have much uh, different uh, individuals or a pool of individuals who have the opportunity to get to the polls. And I think that's incredibly important when you're talking about fairness and you're talking about people's right to vote. And so I think on a number of fronts, uh, this issue... Uh, about it costing more money is, is really irrelevant considering the city of Austin, for instance, I think has a very restrictive uh, donation limit, uh, $350 per individual. So it's not going to necessarily cost more. Maybe a runoff might cost more. Uh, but, you know, it, there, we even have issues with our finance laws that we need to address because I think 350 is pretty low personally. And I haven't donated 350 to a single candidate. Um, but, you know, there's also a loophole that where one individual can can fund unlimited amount for their money, and we've seen that in statewide elections with uh, Tony Sanchez putting something like seventy million dollars of his own money in. So I really think if you want to address the fact that elections cost a lot, you don't do it at the expense of people's voting rights. You you do it the way you talked about, which is addressing campaign finance laws. So you brought up voting rights, and that brings up the question of why does the Department of Justice feel that measures to limit early voting are racially biased. This is what the Department of Justice has stated. I'll just jump in real quick just to say I think it's very reflective of what I said in the beginning about the demographic of people that are going to have the opportunity to vote on a Tuesday versus you have 10 days to vote. So okay if people space it out. I'll go, I'm off this day, I'm off that day. We're looking at online, all the memes right now are about the, the corporations that don't allow their, um, their employees to take off for holidays. And that's something that we consider sacred in this, in this country. And if we're going to have holidays, why isn't, why isn't voting a holiday? Why isn't the voting day a holiday? We see that taken up in the Senate right now. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. OK, so your question was about the Justice Department? Right. Why does the Justice <clears throat> Department feel that uh, limiting early voting is racially motivated or biased? Well, I actually wrote an article about this, which you all can read at National Review, um, and I brought copies of it. Uh, it's frankly, it is a what I find to be a rather uh, insulting and patronizing view. And what I mean by that is um, the, the, the Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against the state of North Carolina. The state of North Carolina reduced the early voting days in the state from 17 days to 10 days. Now. They claimed in the lawsuit that this would uh, reduce turnout. Um, they, they lost in their attempt to get an injunction, and that was in effect for this election, and North Carolina had record turnout. They had more turnout in this election than they would had in any prior election. But was, what was frankly shocking to me was reading the expert testimony of the experts presented by the NAACP and the Department of Justice. And the experts, a professor from MIT and another professor, literally said to the court that black voters are less sophisticated than other voters and that without more early days, they do not have the same capability as white voters to find their polling place, identify uh, issues on the ballot, and identify candidates. And I'm not exaggerating. That is what their experts said. Now, if a Republican administration had presented witnesses like that in court to basically say that members of one particular racial group are less capable than others, uh, that would have been rightly and strongly condemned uh, by newspapers and everywhere. Yet this is the testimony that Eric Holder's Justice Department presented in court. 
Now, it turned out that, that testimony uh, was obviously wrong, and their claims about the law were obviously wrong, because the change in early voting times did not in any way depress turnout in the state of North Carolina. As I said, they actually had record turnout. And anyone who doubts that can go to the uh, website of the North Carolina uh, State Board of Elections, and you'll see the press release they put out recently in which they noted the numbers and said that this, they had record turnout in the state. Well, Hans, I suspect you would agree that ultimately it's an empirical question whether cutting back early voting makes the number or makes the percentage of voters of any particular racial group go up or down, regardless and, of how and, patronizing and it, went up. it went. It it right, in the absolutely. May in the May primary but surely, this year, the number of uh, of black voters who turned out to vote, according to the report filed by an expert in the case, was. Uh, uh, was greater by 30%. Right, in that particular case. And Professor Fishkin, you were saying? Well, I'll just say, it's an empirical question. When we have litigation about these issues, we have to fight about not whether it's patronizing, but whether the numbers are going to move one direction or another. So here in Texas, this election cycle, we had the lowest turnout we've had in more than half a century. That was true nationwide, but Texas was a lot worse. Yeah. Texas was 49th uh, in turnout out of the 50 states, and the 50th, Indiana, had no Senate or gubernatorial race on the ballot. So our state doesn't look very good. Now, I think it would be very you know, tendentious to try to lay that at the feet of the voter ID law that was in effect for the first time uh, in this election, because the estimates of how much that affected the turnout are basically a couple of points, uh, give or take you know, as somewhere maybe two to four points at most. That four point something was the estimate that mm -hmm. the district judge in uh, the case in joining the Texas voter ID law found the most credible. Some other estimates put it a couple points lower. In any event, we have bigger problems than that, driving down our turnout. But I guess from, from my perspective, stepping back from the somewhat uh, partisan debates about turnout, which are always accompany these laws, uh, and fights about them in North Carolina and Texas and elsewhere. It really seems to me that turnout is not the right metric to be using in evaluating uh, the election laws that would be either desirable or legal under the Voting Rights Act. I mean, the Voting Rights Act is not about protecting the right of the Democratic Party to have higher turnout of Democratic constituencies, right? That's not whose rights are protected. It's about protecting the rights of individual voters uh, both individually and collectively in groups to vote. And um, you know, it seems to me that the, uh, the change in North Carolina is one that clearly would have violated Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act had the Supreme Court not struck it down. Uh, the reason that it would have violated Section 5 is that taken together, whether uh, Hans is right about the particular racial effects of the early voting, I don't know. But taken together, the restrictions in North Carolina um, would have certainly failed the test in the sense that they uh, overall retrogressed minority voting strength. They made it worse for minority voters than it was before. Uh, but in any event, the, uh, the Justice Department no longer has the ability to sue under Section 5 in North Carolina. Right. so. We are um, arguing about that law and the one here in Texas using a different um, and more limited set of uh, legal tools on both sides. So I guess my my so that would be section four, section two, two of, section two of the act. Section two of the act says you can't dilute the votes of any um, you know racial group, and you also can't intentionally discriminate. And so I'm sure the lawsuit. I'm sure we'll get to the lawsuit in uh, in Texas, right? Um, which. Uh, well, we might as well just get to right, it now, right. sure. <laughs> since you brought it up. And Judge Ramos did say specifically when she struck the law down that it was a poll tax, unconstitutional poll tax, in her view. So we're talking just so that everyone's clear. Right. There's been quite a bit of litigation in Texas yes. lately. Yes. There's round, two rounds of litigation about the redistricting map and then also about the voter ID law. And both of these are areas where when Section 5 was still in effect in Texas a couple years ago, uh, district judge or special 
uh, federal courts in Washington um, and in Texas found that both uh, the redistricting and the voter ID law violated Section 5 of the Act, but now we're in the current round of litigation over whether they violate Section 2 of the Act and other. Well, well yes. before, before we talk about the litigation, sure. should, shouldn't we say something about the Voting Rights Act overall? I mean, it seems like... Sure. Feel free to, okay. absolutely. Well, the one thing I want to say about the Voting Rights Act is, is that it's probably one of the most successful pieces of legislation ever passed by Congress. And we need to all uh, acknowledge that. And, well, given where we're sitting, I certainly think we should. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and I brought some numbers that, that just graphically illustrate this, so I think it's important for you all to, to hear. Look, the whole reason the Voting Rights Act was passed, because in 1965 there was systematic, official, widespread discrimination, particularly in places like Georgia and Mississippi. And in, 60, in 1964, the black registration rate in Georgia was 27%, whereas white registration was 63%. In Mississippi, the black, white, the black registration rate was 6.7%, whereas white registration was 70%. In 2004, by 2004, the black registration rate in Georgia was higher than the white registration rate by a percentage point. And in Mississippi, the black registration rate was uh, higher than the white registration by four percentage points. Uh, the, the Census Bureau, you know, it puts out a, this great survey. I brought a copy of it. The Census Bureau does this terrific survey after every federal election. Mm -hmm. And then they publish a report on it. And the survey breaks down turnout by state by race, including registration and turnout. And you know, in the 2012 elections, uh, black Americans across the country uh, voted at, at a higher rate than whites by two percentage points. And in many states that were covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, um, the, the registration and turnout of black voters was uh, not only on par with, but often higher than that of white voters. Also, in the formerly covered states of Section 5, so places like Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, those states have the highest number of black elected officials proportionate to their populations than any other part of the country. So it's important to note just how successful the Voting Rights Act was. And that is the reason, one of the reasons why Section 5 was thrown out of the Shelby County case. And it's important for you all to understand the difference. The main part of the Voting Rights Act is Section 2. Section 2 is right. nationwide, it's permanent, and it bans discrimination in the voting context. But in 1965, there were a small number of states that Congress believed needed extra, um, ex extra help, frankly, in doing the right thing. And what, they, what Congress did was basically this. They said, uh, in a small number of states, and this was supposed to be a temporary measure, it was only supposed to last five years, those states could not make any changes in their voting laws without first getting the permission of the Justice Department in Washington or a federal court in Washington. And the way they figured out which states to cover was any states that had turnout below 50%, registration or turnout below 50%, in the 1964 presidential election. So what they basically took the symptom of the discrimination, which was low registration and turnout, and used that to cover those states. In the Shelby County decision, which was last year, uh, the Supreme Court threw out Section 5. Why did they do it? Because after 40 years, the data showed that, in fact, the black registration and turnout rate was now on par with and higher than those other states. In fact, it was better than in the rest of the country, which is uh, not covered by Section 5. So there was no longer any need for Section 5 voting rights act. Section 2 is still there. Right, so do hence, we have any reaction Hence voter to ID, that? yes, exactly. Yes. That, okay. That's precisely it. Hence voter ID, because voter ID is designed to get around Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, and that's precisely the point. And one of the reasons there are so many uh, high ratio of African American and minority representatives in the South, a lot has to do with packing, which also goes back to redistricting and Section 5. Right. Yes, absolutely. So specifically, you're, you're, you're brilliantly laying out the way it's designed, uh, which I think is great, um, that we can like, pick it apart and understand it. But precisely, I think that's what the courts are finding right now, is that there is intentional discrimination going on. And, when, and, and, and when, you, when you can see the results of it, 
And I mean, look, look, at, the, look at the makeup of the Texas House, right? Where, who are the senior members? A lot of the African, I don't, there's like, we have a delegation of about 12 African American members in the Black Caucus. They are some of the most senior members in the House. Why is that? Because they're in the absolute most safe districts in the House, in the entire state of Texas. And part of that is by design. Tom Blade knew this. They knew this was going to have to go through the courts. That's part of it. That gets around, strike down section five. What's the next thing? Oh, so we got voter ID. OK. So empirically, as the professor explained, you can look at the data and you can see uh, who this is affecting more. And in higher ratios, we're finding out that is the same voters that um, he's saying that it's not affecting. I'm it sorry, but that, you go ahead. But that is simply not true, and I'll tell you okay, why. Professor Fishkin. Well, I'll just say a couple of things. One is very interesting throughout the history of the Voting Rights Act, but especially the last few decades, there is a kind of convergence, of a weird nonpartisan convergence of interest mm -hmm. between uh, black representatives in the South and white Republican representatives mm -hmm. in the South. Because for both of those groups, mm -hmm. it's very helpful to pack a lot of black Democratic voters into a few districts and to have the rest be quite white and Republican. I, there's a book uh, called Lines in the Sand by mm -hmm. Steve Bickerstaff, right. uh, a colleague and friend of mine, which, who, who lays out the story of uh, this process in Texas playing out the last right. couple of cycles, as Tom DeLay in particular, even though he was in federal Congress, uh, advanced this goal of, of moving toward a uh, set of legislative maps in Texas in which there really aren't uh, any districts for white Democrats. It's all majority minority districts or Republican districts. So there's an interesting combination there of interests that I think results in the pattern um, that, uh, that Hans mentioned, which is that there are a lot of minority elected officials in the South uh, more than in the North and in a lot of other places. Um, so just, just briefly on uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, and on the Shelby County decision. It's true, uh, and this was the vulnerability of Section 5 before the court, that the formula that said which uh, jurisdiction would be covered by Section 5 was quite old. The formula is really best understood, I think, as a historical formula. It's saying the places that used to have right. a lot of um, you know, the most rampant discrimination in voting, mm -hmm. we think that there's still likely to be a problem there until you bail out their processes for jurisdictions to bail out or be brought back in. I grew up, I didn't say this at the beginning, I grew up here in Austin, actually, so don't take this the wrong way. But when I walk down the uh, South Mall at my campus, and I see you all who are around here know where this is headed, and I see the statues of many Confederate generals and Texas Confederate officials, um, it's true they've been joined by a wonderful statue Barbara of Barbara Jordan, Jordan mm -hmm. and you know some other statues that reflect more modern sensibilities. But you know, there is certainly some sense in which uh, the past is not dead. It's not even past. There's a, a really remarkable set of studies that have found that racially polarized voting is the highest. And by racially polarized voting, we mean Blacks voting one way, whites voting another, and also Latinos voting one way, whites voting another. These numbers, there's some racially polarized voting all around the country, but it is the most intense in the Section 5 former covered jurisdictions, including Texas, although it's not as bad in Texas as it is in, say, Mississippi, where we are now at the point where more than 85% of whites are voting Republican and more than 95% of blacks are voting Democratic. That is a sort of extreme of racially polarized voting that you don't see in any other state. But the more racially polarized the voting, um, the more one might think that uh, the protections of the Voting Rights Act are particularly important. Today, though, it is true that Section 2 covers the entire country uniformly. And there are many efforts to litigate things that might have been litigated before under Section 5 under Section 2. Um, there's also litigation in federal court in Texas right now where uh, the same judge is, um, the same district judge who just found, um, uh, as Joe just mentioned earlier, that, that uh, who's just found that Texas's voter ID law violates Section 2, is going to be holding a hearing soon about this sort of cutting edge question 
of whether Texas ought to be, it's called bailed in, right. which means that Texas would go back into having to um, seek clearance from the court for it changes to its voting laws. So we don't know yet what the standard will look like for bailing in a state and whether any state will be bailed in. But I will make one bold prediction, not that bold, okay. which is that if a state is bailed in, it will be our state. We will be at the leading edge of uh, bail-in law if there is one. And the reason is that uh, many states have long histories of findings of intentional discrimination. But Texas has by far the most consistent recent set of federal court holdings that it has intentionally discriminated against minority voters. And so given those court findings, there's sort of the strongest predicate, although it's certainly not a sure thing, uh, the strongest predicate that the Justice Department and, and sort of plaintiffs uh, have to attempt to get Texas um, bailed in. Okay. Well, we started this with voter ID. Which <laughs> oh, I and we'll get to. back to that. Don't you worry. Okay. Um, well, let me let me talk. Well, first of all, let me agree. One one of the perverse effects of Section Five, which is now gone, is that it made race the predominant factor in redistricting. And I don't know about you, but I think that when you know we all worry about gerrymandering, and I frankly think that when redistricting is being done, what legislatures ought to do is try to keep communities together, mm -hmm. keep cities and towns right. together, keep counties together. But I can tell you that under Section 5, if a state tried to do that, if they tried to pay absolutely no attention to the race of the voters in those areas, they would have been sued by the Justice Department and all kinds of other groups say that you have violated the law. And the support for Section 5 long after it was supposed to have ended, uh, the political support was there, as Joe said, for a very perverse political reason. Because um, uh, black Democrats liked it because it gave them easy, safe districts. And white Republicans liked it because it gave them safe districts. Because they would drain uh, Democratic voters out of suburban areas and put them into urban areas. The urban areas would become safe Democratic seats. The suburban areas would become safe Republican seats. And so there was what I think was this perverse political alliance between the two parties who just loved this system of making race the predominant factor. I don't think race should be the predominant factor in redistricting. In fact, I don't think it should be considered at all. Now, on voter ID, very quickly, this idea well, I'm going to ask a question, actually, right. about okay. voter ID. Exactly. All right. <laughs> and I think we need to, to set the stage a little here, because frequently what we hear in tandem is voter ID and voter fraud. That, that what we hear is people are saying, we need voter ID because of voter fraud. And certainly we can look and see that there are errors that are made, um, clerical, administrative errors. So when I went to vote recently, my middle name, the, the one of the... Um, one of the vowels that should have been an A was an O, okay? So th that's an example of just a pure, somebody typed it in wrong. They, they, they knew what they thought it should be, but it, I don't use that common spelling, or at least my parents didn't. So there you have it. That's a clerical error that somebody was typing in. But is there significant evidence of voter fraud? Because that's certainly what we hear many times is um, the, the reason for these voter ID laws. Well, I wrote a book two years ago that's an entire book because I got tired of people saying, oh, there's no voter fraud in the United States, which frankly makes me laugh because it's so untrue. I wrote a book two years ago that is, this <clears throat> talks about case after case after case of voter fraud across the country. That's actually a funny claim coming in Texas. And I, I don't want to, you know, with all due respect to where we are, um, you know, I was looking at a book uh, by a professor at, from the University of Kentucky uh, by tra named Tracy Campbell. He's written a history of voter fraud in the United States. And he says, that, you know, one of the most infamous incidents of voter fraud in the 20th century was ballot box 13. Mm -hmm. Okay, which I'm sure most of you know about. I did just some quick checking. Uh, September, you've had four people in Donna, Texas, uh, three already convicted, another one indicted for buying votes with cash and cocaine. Uh, you had a con conviction in uh, Woodlands Road, um, Texas, uh, 
uh, people voting in woodlands when they don't actually live there, something else that voter ID can potentially stop. Uh, there's all, I have a whole chart here of convictions over the last 10 years in county after county in Texas of voter fraud. The point is, is that voter ID is only one way of preventing fraud. That's not the answer to all different kinds of fraud, but it is to various kinds of it. And this idea that voter fraud, obviously the voter ID keeps people from voting has been disproven in state after state after state. So I want to it, pick up on the voter yeah. fraud issue though, because I think you, you brought up a, an interesting point here, which is voter ID and voter fraud. So the, the cases that we hear about a lot of voter fraud don't involve IDs. Um, you were talking about issues. Th this chart includes like, two cases right, of impersonation so, fraud. Right. Voter ID can also stop people from uh, registering and voting in places where they don't live. There's been many cases of that in Texas. It also can potentially stop people who are in the country illegally from registering and voting. Certainly That's, so, but I just wanted to have a, a, a bit of a broader discussion here that there are various types of voter fraud. Um, and uh, in fact, I think that there was quite a bit of testimony in this, in the Texas case, was that, was that right? Regarding voter fraud, either, either one of you. Well, it sounds like to me, I'll just make a quick comment, that right. the, the law obviously worked in those instances. Whatever law we have that resulted in convictions, clearly there was a law in place and people were brought to court and they were found guilty. So, I mean, not the, the idea that people might want to fraud the election, of course that's real. The idea that people can fraud the election and not get caught is the boogeyman. That's what we're, that's I think, I think discussion. I think anybody who studies voter fraud, I hesitate to say the other half of the sentence because it haunts me a contradiction. You say, no, I don't agree with this. But I was going to say, anybody who studies voter fraud would agree that it is a far easier thing to stuff a ballot box than to get a large number of people to impersonate others and try to vote in person. Uh, we have a history of not only ballot box stuffing, but you know, in various places in the country, um, absentee ballot fraud on a large scale, like you know, someone taking and filling out a whole pile of absentee ballots for people who are in a nursing home or something like that. And the thing about those types of fraud is they're significant and worth doing something about because they have the potential to change election outcomes. And when we're talking about fraud, it seems to me we're not really talking about an individual rights question. We're talking about a structural question of protecting the correct outcome of the election. So we ought to be focused on and concerned about the types of fraud that have the greatest potential to do that. Now, I'm interested, I don't maybe fully understand the claim that um, voter ID law, tightening up the voter ID laws, because of course in Texas, we always have had voter ID laws. The question is whether, what forms of ID count? And the recent changes- So your student IDs don't count, by the way. <laughs> right, yeah, I mean the recent changes uh, that we're discussing and that are being litigated have to do with removing the old set of IDs, which I've voted under before, you know, the old set of rules, say a utility bill, the voter registration card, various forms of documentation will suffice to prove that you're you in combination with your signature. And the uh, new regime is that you need a government issued current unexpired photo ID from a short list that basically for most people means a driver's license or the kind of non-driver card that you can get from the DMV that's pretty much like or a driver's license. concealed weapon. Or yes, there's a concealed weapon permit. I mean, much political hay was made about how you can use the concealed weapon permit and not the student ID. And I think everyone can see why the party that voted for that might have picked that one and not the other. But, you know, I think that's just a little bit of a sideshow. The question, Indeed. To, it, to my mind, that's, that's more uh, interesting is um, what type of fraud will changing this ID law prevent? And who will be disenfranchised, if anybody, by this law? So those are, the, I think, the real questions. And as far as what type of fraud it will prevent, clearly this would do something about impersonation fraud, where you, you know, show up at the polls trying to vote as someone who is dead or something else. It won't help with, uh, I was very interested to hear you bring up 
um, the prospect of um, you know, non-citizens voting or potentially illegal immigrants voting. Because I've, I haven't been at this issue very long. I've been studying this issue for only about you know, 10 years. But at the beginning of when I was looking into this issue, the conservatives who were making arguments about voter fraud did not often bring up the issue of um, immigrant voting. It was kind of a side point. Now, today, I noticed there's a little brochure from the Heritage Foundation that as we, we got as we came in tonight. Um, and it puts as the first bullet point, uh, number one, you know, possible uh, immigrant voting or non-citizen voting, which is yet another sort of interesting potential problem in elections that doesn't seem to happen very much and that ID laws don't do anything about. Because as you know, you can get an ID as a lawful permanent resident. You can have a driver's license just like anyone else. So requiring you to have a driver's license instead of a utility bill, which is what we're talking about, um, won't affect that. And it's hard for me to see how it would affect non-resident voting, since your utility bill says you're a resident just as well as your ID does. But, but these laws do aim at impersonation fraud. And so we have to weigh how much impersonation fraud there actually is um, against the burdens on people's right to vote. And I'm somewhat surprised at the claim. Um, I, think you, I think you may be pushing it or overclaiming a little when you say it's been disproved. That well, well, I'll be happy to answer that. Well, sure. I'll be happy to answer and that. And then quickly, and then we're going to open it up to our audience. First of all, he is absolutely right. Absentee ballot fraud is a big problem. It's been, it's been proven in Texas and many other states. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. why in states like Wisconsin, Kansas, Alabama, they have uh, passed a voter ID law that provides, uh, requires not just ID for in-person voting, but for absentee voting also to prevent that from happening. Uh, second of all, uh, there is a problem with non-citizens uh, registering and voting in our elections. I've been writing about it for 10 years, and about a week before this election, there was a study released, you all can Google this and find it, by some professors at the University of Virginia, I'm sorry, Old Dominion University, and they looked at congressional uh, survey data, and they estimated that in the 2008 election, 6.4% of the non-citizens in the country voted in the election illegally. Now, I know that's a problem because in my county alone in Virginia, when I was on the election board, we discovered almost 300 individuals who were not US citizens who had registered for our elections. About half of them had voted in multiple elections. And we frankly uh, sent that data over to the US Attorney's Office so they could investigate and prosecute. Uh, they ignored it and did absolutely nothing about it. I'll just close by saying, let me tell you why it's been disproven that voter ID suppresses votes. The state of Georgia has had a voter ID law in place now since 2008. Georgia, because it was a state covered under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, keeps racial data on all its voters. So they know exactly how many black Georgians, Hispanic Georgians, white Georgians voted in the 08 election, the 2010 election, the 2012 election. In all of those elections where opponents said the turnout of black voters and Hispanics would go down, instead it went up. And it went up at dramatically larger rates than the increases in white turnout. In 2012, the US Census survey says that blacks voted at a higher rate than whites in Georgia by one percentage point, and that's a state with a strict photo ID law. Indiana's had a photo ID law in place since 2008. That's the case that went all the way to the US Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court said voter ID is perfectly constitutional. In 2008, uh, not only did the uh, voting of uh, uh, black Indiana Indianians go up dramatically, but Barack Obama won the state of Indiana with their new photo ID law in place, first Democrat to win that state in decades. Thank you. <clears throat> Was your Georgia data just for 2008? It covers 2008. It covers 2010 when Barack Obama was not on the ballot. And in fact, the increase in 2008 in, black, uh, in the overall turnout and, and of black voters was larger than almost any other state in the country, including all the states without photo ID. And the same has happened in other states uh, that have put in photo ID laws. It has not depressed the turnout. And in fact, if you doubt this, 
Nat Cohn of the New York Times has an article yesterday, very, very, very liberal guy, who says in his article that uh, this idea that there are huge numbers of people without IDs has been grossly exaggerated and that IDs have had almost no effect on elections. I, I, have, to say, I have to say two things. Before. Okay, I'm just sorry. two. So one is, uh, this is the social science uh, nerd you're getting uh, when you ask me to be on this panel. But that, that Old Dominion study, which came out just before the election, uh, is certainly a very eye-opening number to suggest that thousands and thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, six percent of all non-citizens are voting, crazily out of whack with all previous estimates. So I was curious, what happened? What, what did this study do? And the answer is this, they have an internet-based panel, it's YouGov, which sometimes does political polling, mm -hmm. based on internet sort of semi-self-selected participants. Of the 30,000 people in the panel, some number of them check the box saying, are you a citizen? No, and did you vote? Yes. Uh, and of those people, they, they were able to verify that five of them out of the 30,000 actually did vote, and they checked the box saying, are you a citizen? No. Now, the only thing about it is, this is a survey that you get, you know, free gift cards and various things for filling out. So it's worth asking the question, are people, you know, sure that they're checking the right boxes on every item? And a good percentage, I think close to half of the people who said, I'm not a citizen, participated in a prior panel of the same study a couple years earlier and said, yes, I am a citizen. So unless a lot of people are renouncing their American citizenship while hanging out in the United States and um, voting in a lot of our elections, I suspect that there may be a problem here with these five people just checking the wrong box. But the, the point that is more of more substantive interest that I wanted to make, and I'm sorry, I know I'm eating up time, is, is just briefly this. I really don't think turnout is the uh, right means that we should be using to assess whether people are being disenfranchised. So there's a, there's a um, plaintiff in one of the lawsuits against the voter ID law who's from Austin, whose name's Eric Kenny, who has been trying for a few election cycles now to get the ID that he needs to vote, because he's not allowed to vote absentee, because he's not elderly, disabled, et cetera. Um, a lot of people have different reasons that they can't get it. His, aside from that he's extremely poor, he scraped together the small amount of money required, but his birth certificate, there's a slight error on it. It's got his last name off from his current last name. And actually, the only way that he can get the underlying documents that he would need to register to vote in Texas appears to be to get a lawyer to um, go to court for him and change his name officially so that his birth certificate will match the name under which he's correctly registered to vote. Now, it's very easy to say, well, sure, but that's just an extremely small number of people who have a circumstance like that. And I think that's right. It's really not that many people who have circumstances that make it actually impossible for them to get the current, uh, the documents that they would need to get voter ID laws. But that doesn't mean that they're any less disenfranchised. And I think we ought to step away from the question of, you know, does this affect turnout more because people are more confident in the elections? Does it affect turnout more because people are so mad about these laws that they go vote, as they say in Georgia, North Carolina? Black turnout is higher because we so, you know, hate these laws. I think we need to put turnout to one side and just say, here we have a burden that's causing some percentage of people to not have the ID they need to vote. And I think, you know, the district judge in Texas said four point something percent. I think it may be only more like one or two percent. But even if it's only one or two percent of the people, the question is, uh, the deprivation of constitutional rights that is involved here in not being allowed to vote, which is pretty important, especially if you're someone who is disenfranchised in a lot of other ways in American life, uh, we need to ask whether that's justified. And I think that's the real question, not turnout. All right, so I want to thank our panelists for this very robust discussion. And um, I certainly think that having divergent views makes all of us, in fact, think more. So thank you very much. I want to open up to any questions that you might have in the audience. Is there a mic or do they just step on up? Step on up. <laughs> any questions? Malcolm Chapman, I live in Rapid City, South Dakota, and I'm happy to be here tonight. I'm here with the National League of Cities. 
Right. Uh, I'm a former Marine Corps officer, and at any given moment, I thought that 20% of my Marines were doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> There's a certain percentage that you put a law in place, they're going to break the law. Right. You make a rule, mm -hmm. you find a way around the rule. Uh, how does that factor into voter fraud or uh, people <laughs> violating the voter right? I mean, so if there's 5% of voter fraud, we don't want any of that. At, at what point do we need to make some corrections to the system to accommodate that? Or uh, the voter right or the voter fraud, is that much to do about nothing? I just thought you could have had a little touch on Well, I think, look, uh, uh, elections are fundamental to a a vigorous democracy. And the only way that works is if you can have confidence that um, the election, uh, when you go to vote, your vote's going to count, and the person who got the most votes wins. And anytime you have fraud that uh, changes the outcome of an election or steals the vote of an eligible voter, uh, that's affecting the ability to, for the democracy to, to have elections and, and do it. And, and I think you should take basic steps. Uh, I, I want everybody who's eligible to vote, but I've seen too many cases of uh, voter fraud, including, like I said, in the book, I go through cases where it changed the outcome of elections. And these aren't old cases, many of these are recent cases. And that means you take basic steps like you require ID for in-person voting and for absentee voting. You require proof of citizenship when people register to vote. You do something else, just, just very basic. A lot of states aren't doing, which is, uh, if you're called for jury duty, you know you have to fill out a form under oath, ask you a series of questions. And one of the questions they ask you is, are you a US citizen? And that information needs to be sent back to election officials so they can take that person off off the registration list. There's a lawsuit just been filed in Maryland because a voter group there discovered that thousands of individuals in one county alone in Maryland had been swearing under oath, penal, under penalty of perjury, they were not US citizens, and, that, and they, they were kept on the voter rolls and haven't been taken off. That's all very basic stuff you should do to secure the integrity of the election process. Just a quick follow-up, I, I appreciate your answer. It seems like there's a vigorous effort to um, stamp out voter fraud and those sorts of things. I wish the same effort was going into creating the opportunity for people to vote. Okay, well, I'll answer that by saying that, again, go to the U.S. Census. The U.S. Census Bureau does a survey after every federal election of non-voters. And this idea that large numbers of people don't vote because they can't get to the polls or because they can't deal with the procedural hurdles of voting is a myth. The, the Census Bureau survey asks people, why did you not register or why did you not vote? And the number of people who don't do that because of some kind of procedural issue is a tiny percentage. It's at the very bottom of the survey. Joe, the I think you wanted to chime the, in the, here. The reason people don't, I don't finish this. The reason people don't participate, the reason we have low elections, the biggest reasons they give is they're not interested in politics, they don't like the candidates, and they don't think their vote's gonna make a difference. That's a cultural issue. That is not an election administration issue. I think part of that cultural yes. issue is the fact that we have laws that demotivate people from actually going and believing that their vote will count when they get there. One of the things that I discovered when we were doing a lot of voter registration is very educated people, people with college degrees working in the tech industry here in Austin, didn't want to register to vote because they were more afraid that if they went, oh, they had heard of it, there was a, there was a voter ID law, they don't know, they just moved here. I'm like, you can register, you can register today, right now, I can help you. And they just had a lot of questions. And, and just, it's, you, you know, I could just imagine these people have expendable money, they have expendable time, so it's not about a poll tax. It's very much about the fact that uh, not whether they, they have integrity of the, the vote themselves, but whether the vote actually matters if they go to the poll in the first place. And I think m motivating people, and certainly on our side, the Democratic side, that has been a major issue, and you can tell across the board, motivating Democratic voters and what our basis is actually what gets, to them, gets them to the polls in the first place. And I, I, I know of the, the Kenny who had that, who had that trouble, and he, he went through hours and hours of bus rides and spent money that he basically didn't have to try and do this because it was his culture and the way that he was brought up by his parents 
to vote, and then that was an important thing. Okay. Did I see another? Uh, I saw one here. <coughs> Pam Richards, I've lived in Austin for about 35 years. Um, I had a go around a number of years ago with State Representative Leo Berman, who claimed to have come up with 6,000 uh, people who had checked off uh, non citizen on a jury summons but were registered to vote. And he claimed that this was clear proof of, of non citizen vote. And I asked him, if you were a very low income worker whose boss said, you miss a day of work, I'll find someone to take your place. If you have to show up for jury duty, you may lose your job. So there's a pretty powerful incentive to check that non-citizen box. Now look at the incentive on the other side. What does a non-citizen gain by fraudulently voting? What's the motivation? Well, I'll be happy to send you, take a look at the chapter of my book that deals with non-citizens, because in there I detail prosecution after prosecution after prosecution and conviction of people who are not U.S. citizens who voted. And the, one of the reasons they did it was because it's easy to do and get away with, and they're living here, they want, they want to vote. And um, about 25 years ago, the U.S. Justice Department prosecuted the largest voter fraud case in the history of the Justice Department. And included in the convictions were about two dozen people who were not U.S. citizens um, who had registered and voted in that election. And the head of the INS and the people who interviewed them said, well, the reason they frankly did that was because the voter registration card that they got when they registered was a ticket to getting other forms of identification. And in fact, if you look at the I-9 form, you know, that's a form an employer fills out um, when you get hired. That's one way of establishing your ID. So they use it as a ticket to get other forms of ident identification. It sounds dumb to us. Why would you do it? But the evidence is there, and there have been all kinds of convictions uh, all over the country of people who aren't citizens registering and voting in the elections, which is a federal felony. It's, it's a federal felony that actually causes deportation. And uh, there's been a, uh, a few notable cases. Uh, they're rare, but including one in, one in Texas of a Norwegian man who went to get his driver's license because, as I mentioned before, non-citizens can get driver's licenses in the US, which raises questions about how the voter ID law will help with this problem of non-citizen voting. But anyway, the, uh, this guy went to get his driver's license. They asked him, are you a citizen? He said, no. Uh, then he went home and a voter registration card eventually appeared in the mail. Somebody had obviously checked the wrong box on some form. He voted and, and faced prosecution and serious consequences for that. So I think there's, there's plenty of noise in the system that can cause people to wrongly believe that, uh, that they are entitled to vote when they're not. And I don't doubt that there have been some cases of non-citizens voting. I, I'm a little skeptical that there are large numbers of deliberate cases of non-citizens voting based on the you know, various uh, articles about it that, that I've read. And I know that my co-panelist here disagrees with that. But I do think that we have to keep in perspective the point that no one really alleges that uh, election outcomes are regularly being changed by uh, even, the, the, even the claims um, in your book of non-citizen voting. To find election outcomes being changed, you need wholesale fraud. And wholesale fraud is best done by being an election official and stuffing the ballot box. <laughs> yes, one here. Yeah, I, just, uh, I think we all agree that voting is a fundamental right in this mm -hmm. country. And we ought to be making, my philosophy is, we ought to be making it easier to vote, not harder to vote. I'd be interested in what the panel has to say about online registration and online vote. I'd like to say something first, just because uh, Travis County here, I'm the uh, work for the Democratic Party, uh, Bruce Elfont, our tax assessor collector, who is also an elected Democrat, uh, pushed 
to have this piece of legislation passed last session. Of course, it did not pass for online voter registration. Not the same thing as online voting. You, would, you can submit a, a registration form online, uh, be registered to vote. Absolutely a great thing to do. It would be much easier. We could go out with iPads and get people registered to vote. Um, but you know, it's unfortunate that, that, uh, that that's the case, that we don't have laws like that. I think there are a lot of other things that we can do as well to expand uh, the opportunity for people to vote. I know in Travis County, you can look at, we're one of only 15 counties in the entire state uh, that actually increase voter turnout. We're the only county of the top 15 in the state, excuse me, uh, to increase voter turnout in this election. And you can look at what do we have? We have early voting where you can vote anywhere, and we have election day where you can vote anywhere. I mean, I think if anything, besides the fact that we were talking to lots of voters and trying to motivate people, that had a lot to do with it, the way we, we allowed for more people and more voting at more locations. And I know one of the interim committees of the legislature um, had, a, had a hearing on online voter registration. I think this is an issue that we'll see again in this session, so stay tuned. I'll, I'll deal with online voting. Very bad idea. Voting registration. Voter, no, but he asked about right. online he, voting. You, he asked two questions. He oh, answered I, I voter registration. Sorry, he's answering the, late, the online the, voting. In the, right. in the late 1990s, uh, the Secretary of State of California put together an internet voting task force. First task force to look at this in the country. Good idea because he got a bunch of folks from Silicon Valley, who are our experts on this, to come in on this committee. They issued a report recommending strongly against any form of online voting, because what they said was is the, the structure of the internet has inherent security problems that cannot be solved. Um, the National Science Foundation did a similar study about five years later, mm -hmm. came out with exactly the same recommendation. And just a couple of years ago, the District of Columbia decided, well, they didn't really want to listen to that, and they decided they would have online voting. And they were so confident in the security of their system that before they put it in play, they issued a challenge. They said, we're going to put this system up for 24 hours yep. before the election, and we challenge anybody in the country to try to hack into it. So a professor right. at the University of Michigan, a computer science professor, gave this to his class as a project. <laughs> okay, within 48 hours, not only had they hacked into the system, they had hacked into it and made it so yeah. that it would change votes, and it, they put in a thing so that when you actually cast your vote, it would play the Michigan fight song. <laughs> so, do, they, do they have our credit card numbers too? No, but the, the, <laughs> the point is the, the internet yeah. itself has inherent security problems that make mm -hmm. online voting any, for any time in the foreseeable future just impossible. I, I think, I, I mean, this is the point where I basically agree with yeah. Agree with you. I, I also think uh, that the spirit of your question, regardless of the application to internet voting, the spirit of the question uh, is worth paying attention to, which is, you know, not everybody needs to vote the same way. We can have different routes to voting. We can have some people voting absentee who uh, have trouble actually getting to the polls or actually waiting in line. There's plenty of categories that Texas doesn't recognize, like people who are taking care of a small child who may have a lot of trouble standing out there for the several hours that it often takes um, to cast a ballot in person. And I think, you know, uh, absentee ballots are, are one way, but we should be thinking about having more than one path because well, there's a lot of people in different circumstances, and if we actually care about um, everyone having an opportunity to vote, it's, it's worth not making everyone kind of fit in the same straitjacket. How are we on time? Okay, so it sounds like we have time for one more question. Is that correct? Okay, so we'll do one more official question, and then we will all be available. And I see somebody way in the back, so... It's difficult to get called on when you're way in the back.
we have everybody registered. And you think that it's going to bump the registration with the actual people that show up at the polls that much. In Europe, they've got 80% people, 85% right. showing up and actually voting. Why is it? Why is there such a difference? And why is the American people so complacent? That to me is a bigger, broader mm -hmm. question or more important question than all these small questions about registration. Let's just wipe that out. Say everybody's automatically registered. I don't think many more people are going to show up at the polls to actually vote. And why is that? And I, I think yeah. part of it is this winner take all. I mean, if you're living in Texas and you're a Democrat and George Bush is on the ballot, your vote doesn't count. You know, with our electoral policy, you can vote for Al Gore, you can vote for Ralph Nader, whoever. He's not going to get your votes because we don't allow any kind of percentage voting in Texas. Um, you know, so we've got a two-party system. We've got single-member districts, creating state mm -hmm. districts. So the, the, the elections are happening in the primaries. And when it comes mm -hmm. to the general election, you have two choices that most of the people didn't, didn't actually ask for these candidates to be on the ballot. They've got very limited choices when showing up in the polls. So that's the question you guys. I mean, what, what do we do to actually okay. get more people to be interested? So, so not an easy question. Uh, why is uh, turnout so low? And um, I don't know if this is one that can be answered quickly in a few seconds. It may be one that we need to conclude on and see if we can uh, discuss um, offline, as it were, given our uh, discussion of online voting. I'll, I'll just go quickly. I mean, okay. I do think that if everybody were registered all the time, you would see an increase in voter turnout. A, there, it's, it's obvious because you, you, you could hardly have less but you're gonna see more. Uh, second of all, I think the fa redistricting, which is a whole other part of voting rights, I think does have a huge effect. And going back to the very beginning of this conversation, the money. The more you have districts that are less competitive, the more you focus those resources, including uh, campaigns and grassroots organizing and door knocking and phone calls, you're gonna concentrate more and more on that smaller portion of the population that votes. And so I think all of this stuff that very much has to do with voting rights does affect the turnout. I'm sorry, I have to disagree. Canada, um, I forget how long ago, Canada moved to a system of automatic registration. Mm -hmm thinking that that would somehow increase their turnout, didn't do it. I wrote a chapter, the American Bar Association did a, published a book on um, voting issues. I wrote a chapter looking at the National Voter Registration Act, a motor voter. Right. And remember, motor voter was passed and pushed in 1993 because everyone said, oh, if we just make it easier to register, turnout will increase. Well, you can look at the data, you can look at the statistics, and it did not increase turnout. Well, if, the, if, the, survey, the survey from the Census Bureau makes it clear that registration is not an issue that keeps people from voting. It's a cultural, societal issue, people not being interested in the candidates, all, all of those things I talk about. Look, in 2008, we had the highest turnout in a presidential rec uh, election, what, three, three decades, I think. Well, it was because people were interested in the candidates, you know, Barack Obama, uh, Inspire a lot of people to get out and vote. You get you get candidates people are interested in, they'll turn out and vote. But this idea that that the the registration process is that that's keeping people from voting, that all the data shows that is simply not. The well, case. I don't think you can on one hand say it's a cultural difference, but then say, well, because Canada. Because obviously we're a different country and we wouldn't even have the Voting Rights Act if we were the same as Canada. Well, if we have the same history, the, the issues point and issues, is, Canada, motor we voter, the reg, making it easy to register motor voter made no difference. Motor voter is not. Changing, that's true. Vote, motor voter is changing the long term turnout uh, uh, turnout trend. I'll that's a very add, small we, thing. We're, we're talking about these changes in the face of a long term decline in, and in, 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 in voter participation. In voter participation. Okay. And the question of of what's at the root of that long term decline. I think the the questioner. Right. Uh, who was asking originally was bringing up some some important points about redistricting and single member districts and the choices voters have before them. The question of whether voters are excited about the candidates or not is not just cultural. You know, it's also how we set up our system. And there's a there's a political scientist whose work I uh, I think is very important on this point, Shanto Iyengar, who has um, has shown that essentially. You can't really persuade people to vote for your candidate with TV ads, 
but you can persuade some of the people who are going to vote for the other guy to not vote. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lesson that, you know, our campaigns have learned well and have managed to demoralize a lot of people and convince them that they don't like the candidates, don't care, and don't want to vote. And I think that's been a successful strategy for some uh, candidates on both sides um, over the years. The net result of which is, you know, a continued downward progress. Um, I, I think that whether universal registration would have a big effect on turnout is hard to know. But I do think that it's worth thinking about how we can remove the barriers so that for the people who do have a hard time voting now uh, and who want to vote and who care about it, at least we should make it possible for them to vote even if they don't move the needle of the overall numbers that much. Can, can I add one caveat to this? And, and this, you, you, know, you know Michael McDonald, who you see, right. Look, there's a guy at uh, George Mason University named Michael McDonald. He has this whole election project. Every, everybody goes and mm -hmm. looks at his data. And he actually says that this idea that there's a, been a long-term downward trend in turnout is actually incorrect. And the reason he says is that uh, those fi the, the figures normally used to figure out turnout are citizen, uh, are, are voting age population. The problem with using that number is there are large people in the voting age population who are ineligible to vote. You know, people who are in prison, people who aren't U.S. citizens. They're not eligible to vote. And by not including those, taking those numbers out, as the prison population, for example, has gotten bigger, Mm -hmm. It has made it look as if turnout has gone down. If you actually go to his website, mm -hmm. he adjusts for mm -hmm. all of those so that he's only looking at um, voting age population that's eligible to vote. And if you look at those numbers, actually, there doesn't seem to be a long-term decline. It's, it's been pretty steady for I think that's a, a problem in itself, though. It, it raises the question of why is our prison population growing so fast? <laughs> why are so many more people losing their right to vote? That why are they not have to be another night. Their another right? night. Well, it will, but, but if you're going to say we're, we're taking these people people out of this equation, American citizens, I think that is an issue. I think so that's a huge problem. So you're questioning the whole premise of saying because you've well, these been people incarcerated, don't count because we've effectively already again. taken away their right to vote is what I'm saying. All right. So I want to thank you all for your vigorous discussion, and I want to thank you for your thoughtful questions. On that note, we will adjourn and continue the discussion. Thank you all very much.